So now, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce today's first speaker, April Jeffries, IUU Global President of Ethnography and Immersive Research. April, you have the floor. Well, thank you so much, Ellen. So welcome everyone to this magnificent panel that we've got. We've got a wonderful interactive discussion for you that I'm hoping will really open open your eyes to some things that are happening within the, the healthcare industry. As, as Ellen mentioned, my name is April Jeffries and um, I also am co-leading our ERG here at Ipsos, which is all about um, anti-racism and about how to bring inclusion into the work that we do. So I'm excited to have um, two very special guests here with me. I have to say up front, we had a third guest, Vic Giat, who is not going to be here today. She actually is a new mom, so we've given her the day off to be able to, to tend to her new family. But I do have here with me um, some very powerful women that I'm just thrilled to introduce. Um, we're going to start with Cynthia Harris, who is the founder and managing director of 828 Insights. And Cynthia, would you mind just uh, talking to us a little bit about how you started this company and what exactly does 828 mean? Yeah, certainly. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me to be a part of this panel. I feel honored to have the opportunity to have this discussion about something near and dear to my heart, and that is healthcare and equity in healthcare. Um, so, so why did I start the company? Man, there's so many reasons why I started the company, but I think the chief of which is, you know, they're just when I was a buyer of research, I couldn't find a whole lot of people that looked like me to help tell stories of other people that look like me. Um, and so combining both my background from a marketing perspective with my training as a researcher, I thought it was the right time a couple of years back to start having these conversations and helping brands speak more authentically to consumers and therefore, you know, be able to extract insights that could actually lead towards authentic action. Um, so that's a little bit about the why in terms of the company name. Uh, my father was the first entrepreneur I ever knew um, and he passed when I was younger uh, and his favorite Bible verse was Romans 8:28. So I needed a name really quickly I named the company after his favorite Bible verse and thought it sounded cool at the time. Uh, you know, I was familiar with 8451 Kroger's agency um thought well if they can have a number name i can have a number name and name the company 828 so that's a little bit about the company name now i did not know that so what is what is that what is 828 what is it what does it say it's a bible verse and i you know forgive me for those that know it word for word but it talks about how all things work together for good and it's interesting because you know i do believe that i think that that's kind of a core ethos of how i try to show up in the world that you know the good and the bad somehow it coalesces to turn together for good things and i try to create the same type of experiences for clients um you know we take the good and the bad on a regular basis from what consumers tell us and we try to coalesce it for something that is ultimately good so that's the verse wonderful mm -hmm. that's new stuff that i didn't know about you even though we have talked several times in the past and our other esteemed guest is maureen o'brien um, she's actually a one of my clients right now. We are working on a very important project for her at the Mayo Clinic. But Maureen runs the strategy part of um, of the Mayo Clinic, and she is really trying to make sure that we are inclusive in how we address people within the system that she is so intimately a part of. So, Maureen, do you want to just give us a few a few sentences about who you are and what you do and why you do it? Sure. Um, so, um, yeah, so as April mentioned, uh, I've been at um, Mayo Clinic. Uh, I actually just had my work anniversary uh, last week, um, 14 years uh, at Mayo Clinic, um, work in the Department of Strategy in the Division of Strategic Intelligence, um, and um, at, um, ha have the privilege of leading um, uh, this research effort that uh, April uh, referenced um, looking at um, the customer, consumer, and patient experience in healthcare um, for um, uh, as part of our uh, larger uh, Mayo Clinic wide enterprise initiative um, related to e EID. So that's what we've been working on um, and have just lots and lots of very, um, I think, powerful data uh, coming back. Um, and um, has started to talk about kind of what that means and 
um, what kind of changes we need to implement to improve, elevate the patient experience. Yeah, and we're going to talk a lot about that as we as we move forward. But but so just for, for the sake of the audience, I know for those of you who have been attending several of these webinars across the week here, um, we've had a lot of discussion about how to design and test and launch products, right, by taking a patient-centric approach. That's what we've been talking about. And we've talked about how to empower patients uh, so that they can have better health and wellness as we move forward. Um, the question today with this panel is about how do we make sure that those experiences include and are available to everyone equally? Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping that what we can bring to life is, is some of the barriers that keep that from happening, as well as some of the, the successful um, initiatives that have, we've used to kind of break through those barriers. So, so first, I'm going to ask you guys um, to a question. We all have sort of come to this place and this kind of work from different places. I'd love to hear your story about the why behind what you did. Cynthia, I know you mentioned a little bit about um, not, you know, in the work context, you know, not seeing people like yourself. But, but what is it that draws you personally into this kind of work? Yeah, so, you know, I, I'd be happy to share a little bit of my background. I said a little bit about my father passing when I was young. He actually passed from pancreatic cancer in 1997. It's hard to believe it's been that long, um, but that was before there was much research at all around pancreatic cancer. And I, if you have heard of pancreatic cancer, it's not the type you want to get. You don't want any cancer, but you really don't want pancreatic cancer. And I just have very early memories of my family literally going around the country trying to find somebody to listen, you know, trying to see what was going on before he had his official diagnosis. Um, and I just can recall so many times when, you know, we were turned away or, you know, we didn't feel like the doctors were really listening. And, you know, those were times that were hard for us as a family. But as I have gotten older, I realized there were some disparity, there's some disparity things happening, right, from an equity standpoint. Um, and, you know, it certainly perhaps may not have saved my father's life, but could have elongated his life. And, you know, I now take healthcare work pretty seriously because I feel that I honor my father through the work, right? I am able to, you know, kind of help people be heard through this work. And, you know, every time I have an opportunity to work on a project that's rooted within the healthcare system and uh, to closing the gap from an equity standpoint, I bring a different type of energy to it, particularly because I feel that I'm honoring my father through the work. So uh, it's a very personal endeavor for me. Um, certainly I'm interested in it from a curiosity standpoint, but it's more than just curiosity. It is a, a calling almost to make sure that no other family, uh, no other child has to experience some of that pain I still experience when I think about those many doors that were shut or those conversations that were cut short. Um, so yeah, that's just a little bit about why I'm personally passionate about this work. Yeah. I love it. Yep, that makes perfect sense. And it really does, you know, draw us into certain spaces and areas just based on our experience, right? So so how about Maureen? I know you this is near and dear to your heart as well. What kind of got you in this space? And so like Cynthia, just a very, very sort of personal family sort of story. Um, my um, my mother, um, so this is something I've heard about my whole life um, and I've understood. Um, through our family story that um, racism kills, racism in healthcare kills people. Um, and um, her family uh, story, she has, um, she has cousins um, that are indigenous. Uh, and uh, one of her cousins um, was misdiagnosed um, with alcoholism. Um, this was in the you know, 1960s. Um, so he wasn't diagnosed with alcoholism um, the Army, the U.S. Army told him that he was acting like, um, because he was erratic and his behavior was unpredictable, told him that he was acting like a drunken Indian, uh, gave him a dishonorable discharge from the Army. Um, he got to the airport um, in Rochester, collapsed and died, or collapsed, was taken to the emergency room, and my mom was working there at the time at St. Mary's and was told that uh, he was going to die from a brain tumor. So he was misdiagnosed, treated very badly, and died as, as a consequence. So this is something that, you know, my mom's family has just lived with for in these decades. Um, and it's, um, it really colors 
like you were saying, April, it colors everything about how you interpret and what you understand about the world um, and what makes a difference to people. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's interesting because um, I know, Cynthia, you can relate to this. We, we work in the qualitative space so much that um, sometimes it's that individual story that will just sort of make it all make sense, right? So I think it was important for you guys to share that. I, um, I, I personally have had similar experiences. My, my oldest daughter was born premature, um, very premature. She was three pounds when she was born. And it was just such an interesting experience because here I was thinking that things were equal, right? And that, um, you know, I would get the same treatment. And then you realize even the questions that are being asked of you or the assumptions that are being made, it's like you almost had to go overboard with, you know, this is my education or this is where I work or this is who I know just because you realize there's an underlying this might not be equal in terms of how people are, are looking at me and my family and my husband and and how that all kind of works. So it is very interesting. Those stories really start to touch you in places that um, that you, you don't often want to go to, but they're real. Right. They're real. Yeah. So. Let me ask you this. So, so we that kind of talks about this journey, right? This patient journey, um, and I suspect, based on our stories, that that patient journey is very different for someone from an underrepresented group or from a marginalized community. Can you talk to me a little bit about what you've seen that's different about that patient journey um, for someone like that versus someone who's maybe in a power or a privileged position? Cynthia, how about you first? first? Sure. The first thing that comes to mind for me, uh, you know, is access, right? Access and education. And what I mean by that is, you know, so often I'm listening to both of your stories, which thank you for sharing. Uh, but a lot of times you don't realize that these things are happening from an equity standpoint until after it happens, right? And that's because you don't really have access to the data when you're in some of these communities that are underrepresented. And the healthcare industry doesn't have access to the data oftentimes because, you know, we have not been doing equitable research, right, for decades on end, right? There's all types of history that we could spend the entire hour unpacking in terms of, you know, inclusion and exclusion in clinical trials, for example. Uh, but yeah, I think the first thing that comes to mind is access, right? And so what that translates to in this patient experience is not being able to ask the right questions or not knowing what questions to ask mm -hmm. or not having the additional support network that knows the questions we ask, right? So for a lot of these, in my experience, working qualitatively with patients, you know, they just don't know the questions to ask. There's a will, mm -hmm but they don't know the way to facilitate yeah. the will. Yeah. Um, and so that's just some of the observation that I've seen. I'd be super curious to hear Maureen's perspective as well. Oh, totally agree. I think that you know, those resources um, and um, you know, the health information um, are just a huge part of the equation. Um, I think that I would add um, that the sense of, because um, we've all talked in our stories about this sense of um, the perceptions um, and how um, behavior and diagnoses are, are, um, are provided, uh, misdiagnoses. Um, people have then don't, because they're misdiagnosed, they have more trouble accessing specialists uh, and getting the care that you need. Cynthia, I think that this, these, those might be some of the things that you were talking about um, in your story when you referenced your, your father, that you just, you, you can't, get to the right specialist, you can't get to the right resources um, because there are these layers of misperce misperceptions and assumptions um, that people sort of have to fight through um, and shouldn't have to. Mm -hmm. I think if I could just build one more thing to what Marina is saying, you know, so often I think we consider the patient journey to start when a person becomes a patient, but that's actually not where the patient journey begins, right? Yeah. It's it's what are you teaching people when they're young? What access to information do they have at a young age so that they can delay the patient's that patient experience? I think when we think about the journey of a patient, we have to think beyond just their patient experience uh -huh. and look at the depths of the road that led up to them becoming a patient at whatever disease state they're in, right? So um, I, I think it's really, really critical to look beyond just the patient experience and look at the holistic experience of a person. Totally agree. Totally agree. Um, the only other thing I guess I would add is that 
the the idea that um, it's okay to ask for second opinions, right? The the April, you said, you know, what's the difference between sort of underrepresented and marginalized groups and and people of privilege? Um, people of privilege feel co completely comfortable asking those questions, saying, "Yep, now it's now I need a second opinion." Um, but how do you how do you get to a place of feeling comfortable doing that? Um, I think is something that people really really wrestle with. Yeah, that's very very true, and I think. They, to your point, Cynthia, when you said they don't know the questions to ask, I mean, some of that is just based even on your own experience, right? So, I mean, we've been looking at some some um, underrepresented groups where children go with their parent who's sick or their grandparent who's sick, right, to be translators or to be or to help them hear better. I remember taking my mom to to the, to the hospital just to be the other ear because Lord knows she wasn't paying really attention to what what they were really saying. Um, but then you see, right, you see how they're being treated and that then impacts how you might think about the whole system. So you're right, it, it goes it goes deeper than just once you're there. It's a whole experience leading up to it. Mm -hmm. So I often talk about this grid, right, uh, when it comes to this power and privilege difference. And on the grid, I kind of map out systemic issues versus an individual issue, right? Things you might deal with individually. And then on the other axis, I map out things that are conscious and things that are unconscious. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about, you know, that upper box is stuff that I'm going to argue is stuff that happened in the past, let's hope, right? This is very systemic, conscious yep. things that were done, right? Clinical trials, things like that, that we've all kind of heard about. Let's hope that that's been sort of at least that doesn't happen anymore, I would argue some of the impacts of those things probably continue to happen, right? Sure. But, but then there's stuff that's systemic and that's unconscious, right? There's stuff that happens in this journey that I don't know that anybody in particular would say, you know, I treated her that way because she was brown or she didn't speak English. But it happens because that's in there. What are some of those things? And as you're thinking about that, um, have you have you ever seen any ways to overcome those? Right. So I'm talking unconscious biases that are baked into the system right now. Any mm -hmm. thoughts on that? Yeah, I would certainly say you know, in my experience, asking the question and not being afraid to ask questions is how you can kind of start to chip away at some of that unconscious bias. You know, I, I do believe that human beings, nobody wakes up thinking about how I'm gonna ruin a patient's day or how am I gonna you know, make somebody's life more difficult. I, that is not, I don't believe how people wake up, right? But there is a such thing as availability bias, right? There is a such thing as making decisions based on the information that is available to you. And if what is available to you does not look like a diverse group of people around you, you might make some assumptions about a group of people that is not like you that are incorrect, right? And that's true for all of us, right? So what I have found has been very effective is just to ask the question. So instead of combatively, you know, addressing something head on or challenging, coming from a more inquisitive space allows said person, said leader, said client, said, you know, whomever to kind of be in a state of receiving whatever the answer might be. It kind of opens them up. So I think, you know, not not making assumptions, but then also, again, asking questions and keeping an inquisitive spirit is, is a great way to kind of get at some of those unconscious things. Um, but but assuming. Can you give me some examples of those unconscious things that you've seen or or even yeah. a patient story around? Yeah, that. I've personally seen things such as, you know, I was speaking to uh, a black patient once a black woman patient who was terminally ill with a form of cancer that was pretty aggressive um, and she said I kept going to the doctor and they didn't believe my pain was very high right like I I kept you know going to the doctor and you know I could definitely sense that you know um, people didn't quite understand how many times this girl had to go back to say, no, really, I need a stronger pain medicine right so those are examples of you know when we have to educate people that it is true that sometimes people think that black women have a pain tolerance that is just inhuman, like unhuman, you know, these unmatched level of pain tolerance. And that that's pervasive within the healthcare community. But, you know, 
not just using what the consumer said, but using other data points to surround what she said to help people understand, you know, this is an unconscious bias that is out there in the healthcare system. Let me help you understand what that looks like, right? Um, so that's an example, just one that comes to mind that was not that long ago. Um, but I'm certain that if, if we have more time, I can think through many examples of, you know, when you have to just kind of ask questions, well, why is that? Why did she have to keep going back? And you will get to those unconscious biases that exist within our healthcare system. Yeah. How, how about that, you, Maureen? Yeah. Yeah, I was getting the same the same kind of thing. We, we, it's it's fairly well documented that the the providers' perceptions of pain um, differ um, based on um, the skin color of the patient, and um, that it's it's just really hard for people to try to sort of communicate how much pain they're in. Um, when the provider doesn't necessarily understand. And, and it's, it, I think you're, you're right, Cynthia, it's not anything that anybody's doing like deliberately. They're not, nobody's way, no, no physician is waking up and saying, I, I want to sort of create pain for people. Um, today, I want to make this harder. I, wanna, I want these, these diagnoses and these painful situations to be worse for people today. Um, but um, just that it's just the unconscious nature of of them um, and um, sort of figuring out how to call that out systemically. Um, I, I do think, though, that um, we have to figure out a way. And I don't know what the answer is, but we have to figure out a way to do that without making the patient the center or the hub of the communication and feeling like they need to solve the problem themselves. Um, is that what you think we do now? To, that's a lot. That's a lot for somebody to try to deal with, to try to be, you know, we, we want people to feel empowered, um, but to have people feel like they have to constantly advocate for themselves is not necessarily the path forward either. Mm -hmm. it's, it tears people down. I 100% agree. And I, I just to build on what you're saying, Maureen, I think, you know, it is upon us, right? We, we, I don't, I don't believe that you're a physician. Are you a Maureen? <laughs> I no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> We're not physicians, right? So we probably won't be in the group. Yeah. So, and I, I certainly don't have the chops. I'm, I am a market researcher. So um, I will not be going back to medical school. But what I will say is it is in our in our boardrooms, in our conversations with companies, in our in our, you know, that's where the conduit kind of voice needs to show up, right? Because mm. you can't, it's not incumbent on the patient to have to advocate while they're also fighting disease state, right? right? Like exactly. that's a lot. It's enough to have to deal with the disease. But you know, that is a, yet another reason why I think the work that we do is so incredibly important because we have an opportunity to bridge the gap of understanding from the patient to the physician and vice versa in some cases, right? Like we can create an opportunity to expand language around certain things. Even in the questions we ask of people, we can expand kind of there. I have seen it happen. I recently did some groups um, in a myeloma space. So again, another form of cancer. And when you get patients together, particularly underrepresented groups of patients, the dynamic is incredibly powerful because you see them giving one another advice. You see them advocating for one another in a way that almost kind of, it is, it's almost an out of body experience because they know what they are going through and they feel heard because they see somebody else that is like them going through the same thing. Right. Um, so, you know, I think it's incredibly important for us to find ways and spaces for those interactions to happen so that we can help patients expand their language, you know, um, and kind of create those safe spaces where they can then eventually advocate when necessary, you know, uh, when they're in the room by themselves or with themselves. So, and I do think, you know, we started this conversation talking about the, the idea of sort of what are the resources, what's the health information that's available to people, what are, what's the, you know, what are the, the educational tools um, that we can provide, um, are, you know, are there, are there sort of spaces and places that we can make that, that just make it easier for people to access those resources um, and, and have those conversations and, um, teach them how to teach people how to, you know, this is how this is when, you know, you should get a second opinion, right? This is what happens. This is what it looks like. And this is how you do it. And and just give people sort of the tools and resources to be able to 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 do those things without feeling like, 
it's always a battle and you know that advocating for yourself is just always really hard how do you how do you make that that easier for people the other so, thing I, i've been thinking uh, the other thing i've been thinking about is kind of the the history that people bring right so if you talk about clinical trials we know that um, people are underrepresented in clinical trial um, trial groups um, that's very well documented um, but how do you how do you address the concerns that people have because they know that people who look like them have been mistreated in clinical trials in the past. So, so all of that history, I think being aware that all of that history comes along with people as they try to make decisions and navigate healthcare, mm-hmm. that that's, that, that creates a, a burden that other people don't just don't have. Yeah. So, so let's talk about that then. Let's talk about how we can help people with that. Right. What are some of the answers? What are some of the things that can be done or that you've seen done that seem to to make sense? I can I can start with this one. So this is funny a little bit, but um, there is a whole vaccine campaign that's happening here in New York. Um, And I just find it so interesting because I clearly they did some research. We didn't do it that said, you know, if there's a doctor that says that this is something you should do, that that seems to work. particularly if that doctor is a person of color. So they have found the most gorgeous doctors of color who are <laughs> in these commercials. I'm like, oh, he's really cute. Or, or, or this woman will come on and she's just beautiful, but she's a doctor, right? And she's saying, this is something you guys need to do. And she understands the community. There's Hispanic women, there's a black doctor. And it's just been an interesting campaign to watch it evolve because it started with one guy who was sort of nerdy looking and, and he did it, but it must have really resonated because you know, they just campaigned that out and expanded it in a way that um, now you can see, okay, that clearly someone realizes that this is working, right? <laughs> so. Mm-hmm. What are some of the things you've seen actually work when it comes to these barriers and um, and and challenges that we can try to overcome? I feel like I'm, I'm answering every question first. So, Maureen, please feel free to jump in. Um, but I will say, you know, I think you bring up something very interesting, April, and that is, you know, it, having somebody attractive, having a doctor that looks like me, those those matter. But I think it's taking additional questions off the table for the patient, right? So when they see someone that looks like them, right, there's just immediately kind of a, a sense of um, this person understands my life experience outside of me as a patient, right? Because again, these people need to be focused on being a patient, right? They're at a time in their lives. A lot of them, you know, it can be a shocking time to be diagnosed with something, right? Um, and so whatever we can do to take those additional questions off the table for them, whether it is having doctors that look like them, whether it is offering some secondary and tertiary benefits and resources that may have nothing to do with disease state, but could alleviate the pressure of their lives and what it feels like to be a part of an underrepresented group in America, right? Like what are those other spaces and places that we can kind of alleviate pressure uh, Mm. from their lives so that they can focus on their health? Um, is what I've seen work really well. Um, and, it, and again, it looks like an additional resource that may have nothing to do with the disease state, may have to do with helping you pay your bills, may have to do with helping you with childcare so you can go get treatment, right? So what are those other things that you can do to alleviate the pressure of being an underrepresented person in America so that they can have a better patient experience and journey? Yeah, I, I think in the indigenous community has a lot had a lot of that going on, too, when we were looking at some of it in terms of being able to get to the hospital and the transportation and all those things that are, you know, that are pressured that you don't even necessarily realize until you're in the midst of it. How about how about you, Maureen? Have you seen that with the Mayo Clinic? Well, certainly representation matters. We hear that again and again, um, that it matters that people are looking for those cues um, that, the, you know, the environment is a safe place um, for them to be. Um, um, I think that, um, you know, reminding your staff. Um, so Mayo, um, Mayo just this week um, reminded all our staff with Ramadan that 
um, we have meals that are appropriate for um, for breaking the fast at the end of the day at, 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 during Ramadan. Um, so reminding your staff, these are the tools that we have that we can do. Um, you know, we had, um, uh, it was just a personal story, and we had a, a hospital uh, admission in my family um, just this week and heard the nurse when we uh, were going through the admission checklist. Um, is there anything about your values um, that we should understand or um, be doing to accommodate um, during your hospital stay? So so wow. building that, I mean, it was part of the admission questionnaire, the admission checklist at hospital admission. It was, what are your allergies? What are your, you know, what's your medication reconciliation? What's this? What's that? Um, and what else should we understand about you as a as a person that we should sort of honor and respect while you're here? Um, and so are people just, able to articulate that? What? Are people, are people able to articulate that? Uh, it was it was kind of tough. <laughs> and I do have to say they were asking the question of, um, you know, a, a white man. So, <laughs> you know, oh. it was. It was, he was like, well, yeah, whatever. <laughs> so. Gotcha. So they, they ask it of anyone at this point, but your point Correct. is, yeah, yeah, those are, those are valid questions, right? Yeah. Interesting. Very interesting. So, so let me ask you this then. We've just been through a major pandemic in the past two plus years. And I do think some of these inequities have uh, had been boiling under the surface and a lot of them have been exposed in ways that um, who knew, right, as we've, as, we've, as we've experienced that. Do you think that right now is, an, is a moment in time? How do you feel about like what's happening today? Let's look at what this looks like versus what it might've been two years ago and, and talk to me a little bit about what you're seeing and what we could be doing um, in this moment in time. Maureen, let's start with you. I, 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 I can go first if that's okay. <laughs> um, I, I do think that there's a, an energy and a focus um, because of the inequities that have sort of been um, on earth. They were, you're right, absolutely right, April. They were always there. Um, all the pandemic did was highlight them and bring every, bring everything to the surface. And yeah. I do think that there's an energy and a focus uh, from both sides, sort of of the equation, from from healthcare providers, um, from the you know, from that side of the equation, to say, yep, we recognize these, we see these. Um, this really does make a difference in patient care. There are things that we have to address here. Um, and, but I also think from from the patient side, it's you know it's not okay that um, that we people die from COVID um, more frequently because of the color of their skin. That that Asian hate surfaced um, because people thought that the virus originated in China, and and you you're hearing people I think articulate um, much more forcefully. Mm -hmm. um, that this, it's not okay. It's not okay to die because of this, you know, because of, because of racial uh, inequality and inequities. Yeah. And so I think that that does make it a different sort of moment in time and creates more opportunities to find the spaces and places that Cynthia has been talking about. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I hope so. I mean, I, from the bottom of my heart, I truly hope so. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I echo that. I, I sincerely hope it's not a moment of time because the reality is the demographics of our world are shifting and particularly so in America. So we have to figure out how to all be in the same boat, right? Like whether you want to or not, different topic another day, but we have to figure out how do we coexist in a respectful, you know, kind of loving, humane way. I think if there's a positive, I hesitate to even say that, that came out of the pandemic, it is that everybody around the world felt like we were all in the same boat and are still in the same boat, right? This isn't an us them thing. This isn't a have and have not thing. It is in terms of, you know, access to care and things like that. But 
clearly this is something that is a human nemesis that we all have to figure out how to overcome. So I hope that that same spirit and tenacity that we had to get through the past two and a half years is something that persists, particularly within the healthcare space. I think, you know, as a data geek, I was very glued to the TV and every time a new data point came out, I was reading through the, you know, the trials and, you know, trying to stay up again, that's a little bit because I'm a, a data geek, but I know that common people and other people just like me, they're, very common in their understanding of these things, we're reading the news and seeing these data points, right? So there's almost, I think, uh, somewhat of a democratization of language around disease and around access, right? I am thrilled that, you know, the disparities in the healthcare system were put on blast, as the kids say, um, were put on blast because, you know, now people have more courage to have these conversations, whereas yeah. pre-pandemic, there wasn't the same sense of courage to have right. these types of conversations right. because it wasn't a mainstream conversation. But now it's very mainstream. We yeah. know that, you know, Black communities were disproportionately impacted by COVID, and there was an exacerbation of all types of issues that led to that, right? Like, and that is no longer a secret. So I think the fact that the conversation is now mainstream is only going to aid in this not becoming a moment in time, that this is hopefully the start of something that uh, will shift for future generations that that my nephew and my niece will not have to deal with some of the inequities that my grandfather and grandmother did and my father, as a matter of fact. So, um, well, well I, I can tell you they're, they're not going to because this generation that's coming up now, they don't they're not they're not putting up with it, to your point. Um, yeah. I had I had a conversation the other day and this is a little different, but we were talking about what women used to have to deal with, just generally speaking, mm -hmm. in corporate in corporate and entertainment, whatever. And and these younger women are like, why did you guys put up with that misogyny? And you're like, I don't know, because that's just the way things were back then. Right now oh. it's changed and they know. No, you're to your point. Yeah. I think, Maureen, you said. It's not, it's not right and it's not good. Yeah, yeah, no, my, uh, my mom gave a talk to her my, when my daughter was in Girl Scouts. She said, you know, when I had to choose a career, you could be a secretary, a teacher, or a nurse. Now you girls, of course, can be anything you want. And I thought, there is my mother out there on the yeah. leading edge, right, of the women's movement, right? And Very true. Awesome. And, so, and, yeah. Yeah, I think that yeah. carries from generation to generation, right? Yeah. So. Yeah. Now there's they're speaking up in a very, very different way. I yeah. I tell you, I don't want to go up against my daughters when it comes to certain things. It's like <laughs> yeah. that's too funny. You know, I think and again, none of us have a crystal ball, but I think we all study patterns and behaviors and that type of thing. And I had a girl on my team just recently tell me I had her tightening a deck or something related to a deliverable. And I, it was probably 445, almost five o'clock. And she says, Cynthia, I'll do it after I go to the gym. And I'm thinking to myself, I never would have told my boss that it, right? <laughs> I, you know, in my early 20s, there's no way I would have said that, right? But for her, it is a priority and it was encouraging to me. I shut my computer and went to yoga that night, right? But they definitely, I think, view health differently. The pandemic, again, if we have something to thank the pandemic for, it is that we're all kind of valuing life in a different way. Mm -hmm. What I've seen happen, especially in the younger people on my team, as an example, is they're prioritizing going to work out, right? Like, yes, I have some work to do, but I'm not going to sacrifice my workout. I can't say that as a, you know, 20 years past their experience, that I'm doing the same thing. And I'm embarrassed to say that, but it's a, it's a generational shift that I think we're seeing happening. And that's I'm sure going to have an impact on even, you know, kind of what their experience is with the healthcare system. You know, uh, certainly they seem, and again, this is just qualitatively observing, they seem to be prioritizing it in a way that my generation certainly did not, um, and generations prior to me did not, right? So I think even that is something we'll have to kind of think about. Mental health is something that comes to mind mm -hmm. as well, how they think, you know, about mental health and how social media plays into that, all of that, which can be a whole different topic for another webinar. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think all of these things, for all of these reasons, this isn't just a moment of time. This is yeah. something that I think is going to be a kind of a quantum shift in a new direction for the healthcare yeah. industry. I do think that this moment, I think as I think about kind of the moment in time question, it's the, it's the opportunity that we have to seize at this moment in time in order to create that, that tidal wave and that, and that quantum shift. And what are the things that we should be thinking about 
given the opportunity that we have right here right now because of what we've gone through mm -hmm. and what we've what we've endured Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so I want to make sure we we focus on some of those solutions. And I, I have a I have a um, picture here. Can you guys see my picture? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I thought this did it so nicely. Right. This equality is one thing. Right. We all are given whatever those boxes are. But equity is something else. And I think the healthcare situation and system clearly has, you know, set some people at a disadvantage versus others. So as we look at this picture of equality versus equity, I'd like for you to just, A, give me your thoughts about that and what you, what you would think in terms of how that works within healthcare, but also ground me then in a solution based on what you see here. So let's start with you, Maureen. Um, so I do think, you know, if there, I think about sort of, um, if this is a resource question again, right? So if we go back to that idea of what are the things that people need so that we can elevate that, that, that patient experience for, every, you know, for everyone and get everyone to the part, point where they can see the field <laughs> mm -hmm. right to build on the metaphor in the in the in this in this picture um are there are what and i don't know if we know the answers yet but right but what are the the those tools and resources um that it, it's it's one thing to say okay here's our all of our health information it's another thing to say okay and and because we know that people have trouble figuring out when and how to ask for a second opinion. Here's a second opinion tool. And maybe that's the first box. And, you know, here's the things that we're doing uh, to make sure that people feel safe and welcome when they walk through our doors. And that's the, the second box. And because, because Cynthia, I think um, mentioned earlier, this idea that it's much more than the patient journey. It's the, it's when first people, people first notice symptoms and when they start searching for health information and and how do you build in those boxes and like I said I don't know if I know the answers and I don't know if anybody knows the answers but we're working on finding them right um, so how do you build in at each stage of that journey from sort of when you first notice symptoms through out the boxes that people need to stand in uh, stand on so they can see the whole field Mm -hmm. Got it. So I'm hearing you say and understanding that what that flow looks like and sort of thinking through that. And those are the things that I, I think people are working on. But I don't know if, you know, if these answers were easy, we'd have done it a long time ago. Mm -hmm. So so I hear you say map out the patient journey and along that way, try to understand where the resources are lacking Yep. And what can we do to insert them into this system so that that helps them through? So that's those that's those other little boxes. You said it way better than I did. Thank well, you. Well, I just I just repeated what you said. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I love it. That that's well, it's certainly a step in the right direction. And I and I have to say that Maureen, you and your team at the Mayo Clinic, while you say you don't know the answers, there is a genuine push towards getting at them. So I do appreciate that. And I, I, I think it's worth mentioning to, to those who are listening that it, it's hard work, but it's mm -hmm. work that you have to be willing to do. Yeah. How about you, Cynthia? Look at my picture. What do you see? Yeah. You know, it's interesting because I see, I see everything Marie was saying and I see, see things a little bit differently too. So when I look at the young, young man, woman, I'm not sure if it's girl or boy, um, doesn't really matter, but you know, don't consider that that person even knows what's going on on the other side of the fence, right? Like definitely consider the fact that they may not, let me correct myself, they may not know what's going on on the other side of the fence. So what I see in this is find ways to just consider that they may not even know what's going on on the other side of the fence. That there's the, anything on the other side of the fence, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. right. So that's just, one of the things that I immediately see. I think the other thing that comes to mind for me is provide some urgency to this equity conversation. I think it's commendable that we're having this conversation today that you initiated, April, um, but have some urgency. Don't wait until the ninth inning to mm -hmm. reconfigure the boxes. And I think so often we wait until 
there's some sort of catastrophic, traumatic, epic event, right? That it requires us to shift the boxes. But I think it's it's very important that we consider it in the first inning and not wait until the ninth inning. So as I look at the equity picture in particular, I think to myself, man, you know, did this patient in the purple uh, t-shirt, were they invited to view the game at the end of the game? Or is this at the beginning of the game, right? And I think it's up to us to decide when are we going to have these conversations. Um, and they may be uncomfortable, right? These boxes might be heavy to stack on, on top of one another. But, you know, I certainly see kind of some contextual things in here, too, of consider when do you move the boxes um, and, and to do it in a very urgent manner. It's important. Our world is changing whether we like it or not. So um, we've got to shift the boxes so that we can all look at the same thing. Yep. Interesting. Got it. So yours, your solution is more around the sense of urgency. Let's get these boxes shifted so that we can even make sure that everybody knows there's a game going on, right? right. <laughs> Much less how to play it. But is there even... In the even first a, inning and not the, and not the ninth. In the, yeah. in the first inning and not the ninth. Yes. Thank you, Maureen. I missed that part. I love this. So I love this discussion. I have one last question for you guys before we have to wrap up. Um, this idea of real change, like real change, what does that look like to you? And how might you articulate us the, the path towards that? So Cynthia. I'm going to get real oh, Go ahead, Maureen. Nope, go I'm going to get real researchy. It, for me, it's all about metrics. If we don't say these are the things that we're going to change, and these are the ways that we're going to measure them. And these are the implications of achieving those targets or not achieving those targets. I don't think we get real change. I think that we have to move past sort of the, um, the, the, the heroic action kind of story. And we have to move past the 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 sort of one-off solutions and we have to get to a point where this is it's built into the system mm -hmm. and it's measured and people are accountable for for change i think that's where real change is gonna happen mm -hmm. it has to be systemic it has to be rigorous it has to be intentional over time mm -hmm. yep it's from one research to another. I love the thought of metrics. I think that's spot on. The only thing I'll add, and you kind of said at the end there, Maureen, is this has to be a consistent conversation. This is not something that we have and then all of a sudden it's fixed, right? This mm -hmm. has to be a consistent conversation until it is just second nature for equity to exist within the industry, right? It's, you know, and who knows, it may not happen in our lifetimes. It'd be great if it did, but before right. it to ever happen, this has to be a consistent conversation. And again, not something that happens as a, a trigger, a reaction to some trigger that happens um, in society or in, you know, in one event or another. It has to be something that is an ongoing uh, kind of conversation. And it has to work both ways. I think, you know, we have to not feel like we are smarter than the patient, right? Like mm -hmm. they have a heck of a lot to teach us. And although they may not talk like us, they may not have our level of education. They may not have our household income, but they have a heck of a lot to teach us. And we have to be willing to be humble and to listen because that's, I mean, at the end of the day, we're all working for them, right? So we have to humble ourselves and be willing to kind of be listeners in that conversation. Um, I think that's what's gonna lead to change. I think it's metrics. I think it's continued conversation and it's the willingness to be humble and to listen. Yep. Okay. And and why, one more, I know I said that was the last one, but I have one more question. <laughs> why is this so important? Why? I mean, you know, as, as someone in the underrepresented group, it's important to me, right? Um, but why is it important for the larger society? What is, what does this do uh, that really helps us all? I mean, you could talk about just the economic value of the lives that have been lost prematurely and what those people could have contributed to society. Um, but we lost them, you know, too soon mm -hmm. um, because they died of systematic racism. Um, I think that's 
it's it feels a little crass to put it in kind of economic terms, but um, you know, what are we missing out on as a society, as a culture? Because people died. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hear you, Maureen. I think, yeah, absolutely. Yes. And, you know, without health, what are what are any of us? Right. Like it, without health, we can't even be the fullest expressions of ourselves. So I think, you know, what's at risk here is our ability to just bring our full selves. Right. And help our patients bring their full selves to their lives at large. And, you know, at the end of life, people don't think, you know, it, sometimes when you get terminally ill or when you have a disease that, you know, you can't overcome without help, right? You get so caught up in that that you sometimes could forget the life part of the equation, right? So having this ongoing conversation is just a part of the life experience at large, right? And so I think it's incredibly important to kind of move the barriers specifically for people of underrepresented groups um, so that they can have more life at the end of the day, that they can have more life. Yes, that they can contribute to society, absolutely. But at the end of the day, I think the bottom line is so that they can have more life, give more life, and we can experience more life with them. And I think from an innovation and kind of design perspective too, right? We know that um, many of like, if you think about sort of um, uh, disability accommodations, mm -hmm. those uh, oftentimes when you talk about uh, specific accommodations make life better for so many people in ways that nobody even like anticipated, right? If I think about the sidewalks when and you used to have to step up to a sidewalk and now sidewalks have the, have the, ramps. the, yeah. Yeah, the inserts, right? made life better for everybody walking down the street, right? Made life better for moms trying to push strollers, made life made life better for everybody. So if we can think about how these, you know, think about it kind of in the same way, that this sparks innovation and design, and we know that affordability and access and convenience are problems in healthcare for everyone. Mm -hmm. Right. How do we design healthcare better? How do we simplify healthcare in ways that make life better for everyone in ways that we can't maybe even imagine or anticipate today? Yeah, I love that. In fact, um, so two things I want to mention. Um, there is a book. It is called The Sum of Us. It's written by a woman named Heather McGee. It is not necessarily healthcare focused, although she addresses some healthcare issues, but she does talk about how racism and the systemic inequities have affected everyone. And to your point, Maureen, she does talk about what she called designing for the margins, right? Mm -hmm. So designing a room for a blind baby We'll make sure that room is covered for any baby that is in there, right? So I think there's something very, very cool to, about that that um, that makes a lot of sense. And that, that, you know, while it is the right thing to do for sure, sometimes it helps to just add the perspective of that rightness just for, for someone, not just for someone else, but for us all. So I really do thank you all for uh, you both for, for bringing that up and for articulating that quite so wonderfully. So we are up on our time. Um, we we uh, don't have any questions, so I think we're going to wrap it up. I just want to say it was funny when I pulled this team together. We did have Vic with us as well at the time. Um, I was teasing you guys, and I said, I've got a panel of some badass women that are going to just <laughs> rock this. And you all have certainly delivered. Uh, you can hold on to your titles there. But I just want to thank you for, um, for taking the time to have this really important discussion. Um, and I think, you know, the people that will hear it will start to think differently about just sort of how the system works and what we can do to inject some some more positive and, and meaningful things into that system. So thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having us. My, my privilege to be on this panel, and I really appreciate the invitation. Thank you. Thanks so much. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.